Hi, my name is Diana Barrent. I'm the founder of Survivor Corps and welcome to the Survivor Corps webinar series. We know that you can't always get to the experts, so we are here to bring the experts to you. Um, and today we have two incredible experts to talk about monoclonal antibodies, which is about the most exciting thing going on outside of the vaccine these days. And so I'm going to do some really quick introductions because you've probably been seeing these folks on TV every day for the last year. So I don't need to add that much to the description so we can get right to all of your questions. Thank you all so much for sending in such amazing questions. They were really um, amazing really incredible this week, so thank you. Dr. Kavita Patel is a non-resident fellow at the Brookings Institution. Previously, she was the Managing Director of Clinical Transformation at the Center for Health Policy at Brookings. She is an advisor to the Bipartisan Policy Center and a member of Health and Human Services uh, Physician-Focused Payment Model Technical Advisory Committee. She is a primary physician in Washington, D.C., and a medical contributor to NBC News and MSNBC, so she looks familiar, that's why. Um, Dr. Daniel Griffin, who I've actually been on TV before with, and then we just actually met more recently, um, is a physician scientist, board certified in infectious disease with expertise in global health, tropical medicine. You're going to have to help me with this. Parasitology? Parasitology. I got it. I got it. Parasitology and virology, including SARS-CoV-2, COVID-19. He is the Chief Division of Infectious Disease for ProHealth, the Senior Fellow for Infectious Disease with United Health Group, and an instructor of clinical medicine at Columbia University and one of the co-hosts of the popular five-star rated podcasts, This Week in Parasitism and This Week in, Viro in Virology. And you've also probably seen him multiple times on TV as well recently. So let's get started. Um, let's talk about monoclonal antibodies. Um, otherwise, so a lot of people turn to me immediately and say, well, wait, wait what, I thought we were talking about the vaccine. <laughs> what, what are monoclonal antibodies? I don't even know what that is. And then I mentioned, well, do you remember when President Trump went to Walter Reed and got that cocktail? And then his friends got that same cocktail. Those are monoclonal antibodies. So just from the get-go, um, I know I'm not allowed to say this on TV, but let, I'm saying it to you as a friend so you know what I'm talking about. It's the Trump treatment, okay? Moving on from there to a more technical description. So my first question is, what are monoclonal antibodies? Where did they come from? How are they made? Is this a novel therapy? Has it been used in other contexts? What is the history of monoclonal antibodies, Dr. Griffin? All right. Well, thank you. I, I am as excited as uh, Diana is about monoclonal. So uh, yeah. let me get everyone up to speed. What What is this? And I'm going to say um, really our most exciting, most effective uh, therapeutic um, what what are monoclonals? So th these are antibodies. These are the proteins that our cells make um, after we've been vaccinated or after we've been infected. Um, this is something I actually got involved with because back in the 1990s, actually last century, I hate to date myself, um, I actually was working with Amgen where we developed a therapy that is actually widely used for osteoporosis. Um, so the, these are treatments that have been around for decades. And, and what happened here with COVID? Um, we realized that people um, who get vaccinated can make antibodies. These are those, oh, I got to get my titers checked. Am I immune? Um, and that's what they're checking. Um, and these proteins Proteins that we're using in COVID, um, BAM lenivimab, we'll be talking a bit about, um, is actually from, it's a great story. So I know we have a lot of time, so I'm going to tell stories. Uh, one this, people call BAM BAM? BAM this BAM. is BAM BAM. Um, okay, BAM lenivimab. But let's just, call yeah. it, let's just call it BAM BAM for all the uh, Flintstone yeah. fans in the audience, which hopefully is everybody. Um, BAM BAM is actually a gift for from donor 45 to all of us. Um, and this was an individual who actually got ill with COVID early on. Um, and what they did in the lab was actually isolate his B cells, the immune cells that make this antibody. And they were able to, to clone up to manufacture those antibodies in large quantities. Um, and what they discovered was that this antibody, when you give it to someone early on, 
um, within the first seven to 10 days after they've started to feel poorly, um, the majority of people who are given this will not progress to end up in the hospital. So if you're looking at someone with a chance of ending up in the hospital, uh, about a 75% reduction in them going forward. So what are these? These are, these are the proteins that our body would normally make, um, but unfortunately with natural infection with COVID, it can take a while for those to uh, crank up. So what the monoclonals are is these are antibodies that people can get right away when they need them, not after the fact. And, and uh, the, one, one little yeah. thing to add to that, just I, I'm, I'm an internal medicine person, so I kind of see that the time, just to emphasize, the time to act is as soon as you receive a positive test, you should not wait to try to see if you're sick or have that conversation with your doctor, even as you're getting the test, if you're getting one in a doctor's office. Yeah, I mean, what that's Dr. Patel right, says, I, I, oh, Dr. I'm going to let you go down. <laughs> So that's perfect. And yes, one of the things that we are seeing most is one of the difficulties is that people get COVID and they don't feel so bad for the first few days. And so they're like, oh, I'll put it off. I'll wait till I feel really bad or I'll wait till I get to the hospital. But by the time you get to the hospital, it's too late to receive them. So speaking of that, Dr. Patel, can you compare the mechanism with um, monoclonal antibody infusion, uh, the plasma that we're getting, the vaccine, uh, hyperimmune globulin, you know, all of these different therapeutics need to be given at a different stage and work mechanistically differently. Can you sort of walk us through on a timeline about which one you would use at which stage and how they act differently within the body? Yeah, so, and, and, and I'm going to have my friend, Dr. Griffin, I like to say I'm a primary care physician that knows exactly what the limits of my knowledge base are, but because I've had a lot of experience, ironically, monoclonal antibodies are not new to us in medicine. They become new a little bit in the nomenclature, but we've been using them in cancer treatments, and we've been talking about monoclonal antibodies for a variety of other diseases for decades, to be honest. So for people who are wondering like, oh, this is kind of quote new, new maybe because COVID is new, but not new. And, and maybe the best way to distill it, just building off of something Dr. Griffin said, um, there, these are antibodies that are kind of manufactured in a laboratory setting, but they target that kind of spiky red coronavirus spike protein that we've all kind of gotten to know and dread a little bit and coat the spikes basically to disable the virus from attaching to other healthy cells. So you can see why, Diana, it's important to try to have this therapy as soon as you get that positive diagnosis, because the goal is to really prevent the spread of infection in your body and to kind of literally limit the duration and severity of the illness. Really what's interesting, some people have said, um, oh, you know, these variants and all these other things, they're making these monoclonal antibodies ineffective. And what I would say is that this is certainly something that I, I'm confident, and Dr. Griffin's probably part of some of this research that people are looking at. But to me, the presence of these variants make it even more important to have kind of this available at the time immediately of diagnosis. And if you think that you're healthy and, and I like to think I'm healthy and you don't qualify, um, we might review some of the criteria for who can receive this under some of the approvals or authorizations that are available for the food and, by the Food and Drug Administration in the United States. Um, then just building forward to some of your comments about when to use other treatments, convalescent plasma, hyperimmunoglobulin, ah, hyperimmunoglobulins, and then I'll even just kind of double in and add to that, Diana, just other kind of antivirals, remdesivir. That's another very popular one that I think people have heard because of the president, as well as other people who have received remdesivir and other treatments. Those are generally treatments that we use depending on the stage of illness. And because these are still considered, with the exception of remdesivir and some other drugs, these are still considered emergency use authorization where the benefit outweighs the risk right now and makes us feel very comfortable to use them. We really do try to stick to the criteria of the emergency authorization. So maybe we can go into a couple of different examples, but I know what I really wanted to drive home is that mechanism, and Dr. Griffin, correct me if I'm 
trying to make this for my brain too simplistic, but it really is to use as early as possible because it really does try to prevent that spiky protein from doing what it's, we know it does and triggers and reproduces and attaching in a way that causes that cascade in someone's body. So would I be wrong in character, characterizing monoclonal antibodies in the same way as a vaccine that they are all essentially working as antivirals in that they are cutting, they are stopping the virus from replicating, is that correct? I'll jump in on that, Diana. So Diana's never wrong. <laughs> so no, and I think you're you're no, right. Tell me you're, I'm wrong. Tell me. <laughs> no. I, I haven't taken science in high school. Please, the whole point of this is to no. tell me that I'm wrong. <laughs> okay, I'll I'll look for those things and then I'll very gracefully, <laughs> tactfully. But yeah. no, so that's exactly what this is. These are these are antivirals, and I even have sometimes said to people, these are the monoclonal antivirals. Um, and and I love the question about timing. When when do you do different things? And I, um, that was a paper that took me, I say, weeks of my life, but um, years off my life getting together 35 people from around the world to let's define the stages, let's really talk because timing matters in COVID. So if you plan on getting exposed to COVID in, um, we're in March, so in, um, in May, for instance, so you got two months ahead of time, go ahead, get your vaccine, um, you know, six to eight weeks from now, you'll have your own antibodies, you'll be fine. Um, but a lot of us don't plan. We don't, we don't schedule our COVID exposure. Um, so this is, you get a COVID exposure, you start to feel bad. Um, that, that viral phase of the illness is that first seven days, seven to 10 days. Um, you can't wait eight weeks for that vaccine that maybe you recently got, or maybe the vaccine that you're scheduled for at the Javits Center in the far future. You need those antibodies, you need that protection now. Um, so this is really um, a stopgap. This is you haven't made those protective antiviral antibodies um, yourself. Um, so we can give them to you with the monoclonals. Um, and where does this fit in with the convalescent, the hyperimmune plasma? Um, this is what we were after. This is what we were trying to do with the convalescent and the hyperimmune plasma. We were trying to get these really potent antibodies into people as early as possible. And what we've seen over time is that, you know, if you're going to try to do the convalescent plasma, if it's going to work, um, the times we've seen um, evidence of benefit has been really early, really high titer. The nice thing about the monoclonals is it doesn't have to be within the first three or four days. We're seeing people get these seven, eight days, still get the benefit. Um, so this is this pretty exciting, fact, pretty powerful stuff. To, you can use it up to 10 days, correct, Dr. Griffin? Yeah. I, so yeah, I, Dr. Patel, that, that is fantastic. Right. Um, yeah, and I and I have to say I'm going to tell another story. Um, you, we'll see if people can tolerate me. I don't know if I think I click something where you can mute me remotely. Um, but when I first got involved with the monoclonal antibodies was the beginning of April, right? A year ago, eleven months ago. Um, and uh, Steve Catani, he was a chief scientific officer at uh, United Health Group. I think he's still with them. They haven't let him go. He's a bright guy. And he called me up because he knew my background um, with prolia denosumab, the monoclonals for, um, for osteoporosis. And uh, what we realized is they were setting up trials to give monoclonal antibodies to people in the intensive care unit on ventilators in week three of illness. Um, so we called up the folks at Regeneron and we said, what are you doing? Isn't that way too late? Isn't this an antiviral therapy? Don't you want to try this in the first week? Um, and the response was, we would love to, but we don't know how to do those trials. Our partners are acute care hospitals. We know all these ICU doctors. We can call them up and set up these trials. Um, and we had a conversation. We said, you know what? I'm not sure that that's a good idea. One is you probably, the horse is out of the barn. I spent yeah. 20 years in Colorado where we have horses and barns. Um, why are you doing this? Why don't, and we actually, at the end of the conversation, um, came to an agreement and we were able to help set up these trials in the first week, urgent care centers. Um, when, when an antiviral makes sense, not after the fact when someone's sitting in the, in the intensive care unit on a mechanical ventilation device. So first seven to 10 days, timing is so critical with these therapies. And I think you, you've got, it's a numbers game. You can't say, I think I'm feeling okay. Let's see how it goes. You know, that's like opening your gate, letting your dog run out to the neighborhood, crossing your fingers that they won't get hit by a car and that they'll come back. Keep that gate closed, get those monoclonals in. Um, because if you do, instead of ending up in the hospital, a lot of our patients, and Dr. Padel could probably speak to this, within a day or two say, oh, I feel great. Um, yeah. 
And the people that don't get it have to go through not only that week, that second week. And as we now know, 10 to 20% of people, it doesn't end after just two weeks. Mm -hmm. And we do think clinically, at least um, when I've worked um, on the inpatient side, not in the ICU, but just on the general kind of COVID wards, uh, we really do kind of feel it's, it's that when people are kind of in the hospital and we've already started them on remdesivir or dexamethasone and, and other things, that is not the time. And Dr. Griffin tell me if we're doing the wrong thing, but we really are, if they're hospitalized and they require what we call supplemental oxygen, we really are looking at a different kind of toolbox of what to do. So again, it's why I think even for people who, you know, it's worth questioning, anybody watching this, anybody who has a family member, you may not think that you're an appropriate candidate, but you don't know until you start the conversation. And the right time to start the conversation in my mind is if I have a high suspicion in the clinic setting or from a phone call, I will already plant the seed if, if I think that that's, if, if I think monoclonal antibody treatment is the right thing to do for that patient, even before I get the test result, I can't start it, but knowing how it's a process, it can sometimes take a while to arrange and I can get the test result. If I have a high clinical suspicion, then that's, that's the time to start the conversation. 100%, I agree. And I think that one of the challenges in getting the message across about monoclonal antibodies is that we have basically excised the general practitioner from the COVID landscape. Nobody goes to their doctor with COVID. Uh, we are using the emergency room as our first line of medical defense. And so where are you going to get this information from? You're, you're not really going to your doctor for this. And so um, this is where you go. You go to gotcovid.org. Please share it with everyone you know. It is a portal to get free monoclonal antibodies to find out whether or not you qualify. If you qualify, it is free. You can get them. And if you're over 65, it includes a free at-home infusion. A nurse will come to your house within 24 to 36 hours after your positive diagnosis. And if you don't qualify for them under the EUA, there are plenty of trials. And we'll talk about that in a moment. Um, I, I want to go into a little bit of a technical question. So I'm going to go to Dr. Griffin on this one, on the exact differences between the monoclonal antibody products from, we know that there are two, there's one from Regeneron, there's one from Eli Lilly. Um, how are they, um, how are they the same? And can, I've heard some rumors that perhaps the Eli Lilly one could be used prophylactically. And what would the point of that be if one had access to the vaccine? Okay, no, these are, so these are great questions. So um, this will get us, what's the difference between a cocktail and a monoclonal and a monoclonal cocktail? So we'll get into the weeds on this. I love, I love uh, that there's a cocktail involved though. I mean, that's already- well, Not that kind of cocktail, Daniel. <laughs> <laughs> Let's talk about cocktails. Well, I have to say, right, my first job was actually as a physician up in Montana, and we could actually order beers for our patients. So uh, here in New York, we don't allow cocktails, beers, wine. It's very, you know, a bunch of conservative Puritans here. Um, but no, these are not alcoholic beverages. These are therapeutic products. Um, and what they are is whether or not you're getting one monoclonal or more than one. If you get more than one, you mix a couple in there, we call it a cocktail. Um, so the first, the first products that came out, um, we'll, we'll start with the Regeneron. The Regeneron was a cocktail. It was two different monoclonals. Um, don't try to remember the names other than Bam Bam because it's just, you know, I think when uh, someone called it the Regeneron, um, I, was, I was talking to a New York Times reporter. I said, please don't call it the Regeneron. Well, okay, it's now. Regeneron is the name of the company. It's not the name of the for anyone went through the news cycle last fall. It is not the name of <laughs> It's the name of the company. Okay, moving on. <laughs> yes, yes. Moving on, moving back, moving forward. So the Regeneron cocktail um, is two two of these monoclonals. Um, one is from, from a person. Uh, the other is actually from a very fascinating um, humanized mouse, like say the $120 million mouse. Um, and it's two different antibodies. Um, and the early trials that Regeneron um, put forward, about a 50% reduction in someone going forward if they get two of the monoclonal antibodies at the same time in a cocktail. 
Um, now, Eli Lilly uh, did a similar early phase study uh, just with one antibody, bamlanivimab, bam, bam. Um, and uh, this is the one people have come to know a lot about. Uh, this was about a 74% reduction, just a single one. Um, but time has moved forward. Eli Lilly now has their own cocktail. Um, they add a second antib antibody there. Um, it's called Atessavimab. I told them to put an L, call it Etesilivimab. It would sell better, but you know they, they, they had apparently named it before I got involved. Um, um, if you're into renaming things, can you give the NIH a call and tell them that oh. SARS-CoV-2 PASC is not <laughs> scientifically incorrect. It is unpronounceable. Yeah. And not exactly a real nod of respect to a patient community to give them a name of a disease that cannot be pronounced and is also incorrect. I will. So, I will make sure to mention that. that. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> um, so yeah, so back to cocktail. So now, um, so now we have the Regeneron cocktail with a couple antibodies um, in there. Um, Eli Lilly has now their cocktail, and actually it was more impressive, uh, the results with their cocktail. Um, so uh, the, the government, the government, that's us, I guess, as my wife likes to say, um, we have purchased um, 100 million doses or spent $100 million, uh, something along those lines, uh, to get cocktails now. So um, as we move forward, and this is one of the critical things, well, why cocktails? Why not just use one, um, one medication, one monoclonal? Why monoclonal cocktails? Um, and this is, I think, where the variants come in. Um, there's a couple of things here. If your virus changes right at that sweet spot on the spike protein that your antibody is targeting, it's nice to have backup. It's nice to have another antibody that will bind to another one. And maybe, and I think down the road, we're already looking at the potential for three or four monoclonal cocktails. Um, and a nice- become a polyclonal cocktail? Well, so it won't be polyclonal, and, and what is? And this is great. What is the difference between poly and mono? Right? If you add a whole bunch of monos, doesn't it become poly? Um, and the difference here is a poly. <laughs> no, no, Diana, that was an excellent question. Um, polyclonal is a whole mess of stuff, and you don't know what all the parts are. Monoclonal cocktails are you have each well defined that you add in there. Convalescent plasma and a hyperimmune globulin would be examples of polyclonals where even if you have multiple monoclonals, it's still considered a monoclonal treatment if they're, even if they're done in conjunction with one another. Exactly, so that would be the mix. Yeah, the mix is the polyclonal is a whole mess of stuff. And then the monoclonals, you're adding one at a time, a little bit of tequila, a little bit of vodka, maybe a little rum. <laughs> so you can't talk about $120 million mice without going into slightly more elaboration. How would these mice perhaps be involved in this whole variant issue? And um, like, how do you how do you um, revise this cocktail? You know, this I the more I read about these variants, particularly the Brazilian one, I mean, it makes me vaccine and all never want to leave the house again. No, and I think that's great. Um, that you never know, no, not that you want to leave the house, but that you're going in that direction. Um, that's one of the great things about this $120 million um, mouse pair is these mice um, can very quickly be exposed to whatever changed um, spike protein, and they they can make antibodies to that new um, variant spike protein. Mouse antibodies or human antibodies? So what they've actually done in these mice, and this was not easy, which is why I think they're we have such a high, yeah, high price point, um, is they have replaced the whole genetics of the antibody part of that mouse with the human genetics. Um, and that took years and years. I mean, people, this was a career thing for some people. Um, and now when these antibodies, when these mice make an antibody, it is indistinguishable from a human antibody. Little subtleties and sugars on there. Um, but once you go ahead and do what we do, um, it is indistinguishable. It is basically a human antibody that this mouse has, has produced. Um, and you can very quickly, in a matter of weeks, um, get new antibodies. And just to get everyone reassured, um, Eli Lilly, Regeneron already has um, in the pipeline antibodies that can neutralize any of the variants that you're hearing about in the press. That is remarkable. Dr. Patel, um, if you get monoclonal antibodies, how long will they protect you and does it promote healing? Will it actually spur natural antibody production and a natural T cell response like getting COVID convalescent plasma does? 
our members who were hospitalized and received CCP then went on to produce their own right. natural antibody response and they've become donors themselves. I mean, it's an incredible thing to watch. Right. But I remember being told that um, back when President Trump and his friends were receiving this, that they would not actually be walking away with any natural immunity. Um, so can you go into that? And if that is the case, how long afterwards can you receive the vaccine? Yeah, so let me actually let me start with that, Diana, just because that's becoming kind of the most popular question uh, uh, of the, of the I've, I've actually had a number of people who, true story, first dose of the vaccine um, and then did get, and actually, let me put that, that's a bit of an outlier. I do want to ask Dr. Griffin kind of what he did, because I think we've had to handle things in different ways. In general, if you had not received the vaccine and you did receive monoclonal antibodies, we're encouraging people to wait 90 days to get their first dose of the vaccine. Um, I will say that there have been some exceptions made, but really because of in the past two months, the supply, as you know, three months, the supply of the vaccine has been incredibly difficult. So there have been some very, very high risk patients who with people like Dr. Griffin, and infectious disease specialists approval, they've been able to get it like within, you know, 72 days after receiving monoclonal antibodies. So it's in general, though, we're recommending that people do wait 90 days to receive it. Um, and I'll actually add, I'm going to tag Dr. Griffin because I want to get to this answer. I'm curious, Dr. Griffin, do you have you had I have had a patient who received dose one of the vaccine then did get COVID and we went ahead and elected because it was only several days after that individual got the vaccine, they actually did receive monoclonal antibody treatment. Is that something that uh, you've seen or had experience with? And then I'll go back to Diana's original question of how long the antibodies last, kind of what they can expect, what they can and can't do, because that's something I've had to deal with as well. Yeah, no, so we, we certainly do that, um, give people um, the monoclonals if they've been vaccinated. Um, and, and, I, and I don't actually use a minimum time at all, right? We sort of know from our, our studies uh, that if an individual gets a shot, it's going to take a while even after that second shot with the mRNA vaccines and actually quite a while with the, the J&A right. that's out there. Um, so initially there was a lot of discussion. Well, you know, you got to choose. You, can, you can't have both. Right. Um, uh, but that's, that, that's, you know, that was the, hey, there's a shortage. You're being greedy. But I don't think it made science. Right scientific sense. Um, you know, okay. there are, there are going to be people who, boy, if you get COVID after being vaccinated, um, you're, at, you're high, you, high risk, right? Yeah, you're at high risk. So yeah, that would be an individual we jump in. Um, and then, you know, you, you can talk a bit more about, you know, we, we wait the time. Um, and the reason we're waiting the time is that we know these proteins um, only last so long. We talk about half lives of being, um, right from 21 to 26 days. So, you know, you get a massive amount of these and by about three months, they've usually gone. You're now, you know, ready for your vaccine. We're worried that the, um, that the monoclonals might impact your ability to get a robust response from the vaccine because they may be binding up that spike protein you're trying to show to your um, immune cells. So you try to show it to the immune cells and they, they get rid of it and the immune cells don't get to see it. So that, that's our delay. But um, I am very liberal. If a person um, has gotten the vaccine, um, and right, this is the highest risk people getting. If they go on to get COVID, um, they're a high risk individual in general. And so if they're eligible, I have no hesitancy going ahead with the and, monoclonals. And just to, pig, just to piggyback on that, to get back to Diana's kind of original questions, the half-life of most of the monoclonal antibodies that we've talked about are about three weeks for like IgG. So there are, that's kind of the half-life. And remember what a half-life is. It doesn't mean that it, it, it's a half-life of, kind of the time where you see literally half of the levels that we would expect. But we do know, for example, that that lasts for much longer beyond that and offers protection as well. So the kind of conservative kind of thinking of like asking people to delay 90 days has really to be, to be honest and confirming it from what Dr. Griffin said, been related to the supply. We should see much more kind of availability. I've already seen people who are it's much easier to get vaccinated sooner, especially with the recent authorization of Johnson and Johnson. And then let's see, uh, you asked about how long this lasts, what else can they do? Would it, would it create somebody's natural antibody response? So like I oh. had natural COVID, I, I got COVID a year ago, mm -hmm. minus five days. I got my vac first vaccine yesterday. 
Mm -hmm. Three weeks, I'll get my second one. Two weeks after that, I cannot wait to get my titers tested because they should oh, be. I see. Right. So, right. Vax plasma. Would the same thing be true of somebody who got monoclonal antibodies and then received the vaccine? Would they would they have this in you know superhuman antibody titer as well, or is that only off off of a natural infection response? Well, not based on, so antibody testing as, as currently authorized, um, especially the type of IgG titers and some of the things that we see, remember that, so no, you wouldn't see, what you're seeing on most of the tests that are available are kind of a presence or absence of antibodies, and you're not necessarily picking up the level of granularity that we're seeing with the antibody treatment. And then to your point, Diana, of, and I'm, I'm actually candidly a little nervous about people who have gotten vaccinated and use some of the, what I would say are uh, kind of, you know, a little bit more of like store variety testing that's been offered in clinical offices and in drugstores for antibody detection, because I would just argue the sensitivity and specificity of those tests are not great. Um, Dr. Griffin, do you agree? But it should not create some super, you will not detect some superhuman response on those tests, no. Yeah, so I'll, I'll agree on both. Um, I think that, um, you know, this is actually, I think, even in uh, some of the product inserts, they, they say that if you get this soon enough and it clears the virus, it's not going to give your immune system a chance to see the virus. It's not going to give your immune system a chance to go into that um, early inflammatory or we, we hope not allow you to end up going into long COVID. The, the whole idea of giving this early is basically going to, as if your body never saw COVID, it just clears it right out. Um, and it's like cleaning your house before, you know, my wife gets home. It's like, kids, she's coming home. Don't let her see this. And I think that's what we're hoping to do is, you know, is, is clear that virus really soon. Um, and the other side, if you do want to look at your antibodies that you're going to produce to, to spike protein, um, that's what, so Diana, that's what you're going to really want to look at because those are the ones, and actually that's most of our monoclonals target spike. That tends to be our most powerful neutralizing antibodies. Um, so as long as a person knows what they're doing, but I hate to say this to my medical community is colleagues all the time. I don't know. I did this test and I said, no, that's not the right test. Let's spend some time. So you got to work with a physician who knows what they're doing we're here and we have the time, although I still have a ton to get through, but can you give us a quick um, description of the difference between a nucleocapsid antibody and a spike protein? Because there are tests, each te one, each test tests for something different, yet um, the patient has to do some real digging to find out which test they received. I'm high on one and low on the other. What, what is the difference between the two? Sure. Um, I'll jump in first, but then Dr. Dr. Patel, I'm going to, I'm going to have you answer also. Um, so most of the assays that are commercially available, and there is an FDA website that gives you a list of all the IgG tests that are commercially available. Um, most of them, so Roche is one of the most popular. That's what's used at the largest health system uh, here in New York state, but we won't mention their name. Um, it looks at nucleocapsid. Um, and so what are we talking about? That is the most abundant protein um, that we see in a viral infection with SARS-CoV-2, the virus that causes COVID-19. So that's the one that gets targeted in natural infection. Our um, vaccines only have spike protein. So that's gonna be our second, say our second most common protein. That's the protein that binds to the ACE2 receptors. That's the one that you wanna gum up with antibodies and block so it can't bind. Um, so if you send off a test after your vaccine, for nucleocapsid and this person never had an infection, it comes back negative, everyone panics. Um, the, the only sort of easily accessible, commercially available um, spike antibody test is actually offered by LabCorp. It is the LabCorp semi-quantitative anti-spike IgG serology test. Uh, Quest is gonna get in the game because hey, there's a profit to be made here, people wanna know. Um, and, and then if, you know, a lot of the research labs have, you know, really good testing, being able to look quantitatively at the nucleocapsid, quantitatively at the spike. But we think if you look at the work on neutralizing antibodies, that the level of anti-spike antibodies is the best correlate to the neutralization um, antibodies that we're seeing in the research lab. So Dr. Patel, but, throw but it I'm at you. Going to, I'm just going to rain on all of your parades. And <laughs> yes. The majority of, if you go to any 
website, if you just Google, which everybody can feel free to do, antibody testing, COVID antibody testing near me, you will have a plethora of websites, none of which tell you what kind of antibody test. I, I sometimes can be able to guide people um, because there are some uh, physicians' offices or hospitals, kind of med medical centers that say these are IgG or IgM, but very rarely do you actually know what you're getting. And so I think just, just not to try to generically label everyone, because I think, Diana, you have to admit you're a little bit of an outlier in how much you know about things. The majority of people are really looking and doing antibody testing to either check to see did I develop that immune response after a vaccine um, or maybe after an, you know, monoclonal antibody? You know, did I develop an immune response? And Dr. Griffin's right. You know, hopefully you don't because it kind of sideswiped it. Or previous to the vaccines and MABs, we were using antibody testing to see if people had had the infection because as you all know, we did a kind of a crappy job in our country of testing. So I, I would say the majority of people think that that's what they're going and then they get a test, they don't quite know what it is and then they're told it was negative or it was positive. And they're asking um, a very valid question but not necessarily getting the test to answer that question. So I personally have a lot of skepticism about telling people to go get tested for antibody treatment unless they have a very sophisticated conversation with the person on the other side. How about now that there's a T-cell test available, would that be a better indicator? Well, it depends on when you do it. I mean, so T-cell, so I, I mean, T-cell testing would be one, it's not as readily available. And two, I'm not so sure that people are timing to see if we just don't have, I'm trying to think, uh, Dan, when would you say is the right time to try to see kind of T-cell development? It would just be hard for me to recommend to people broadly about when to go do that. And candidly, I always ask about, I guess, let me go back since I do gener like general medicine. What is what the purpose of the test? test? Why, what are you trying to accomplish with that result? And that's the question I would ask. And I'm not I, so sure. From, from a patient perspective, I do believe that we are looking towards a much more complex landscape in a year from now, where it will be very important for patients to know the granularity of their medical profile in having to make choices. Um, and so I'm a big, big advocate of patients trying to figure out their own um, information. But we, we have so much to cover, and we could talk about this for ages, but I can. <laughs> Yeah, I just I just think that I just think that we're those are like first world problems and I'm dealing with kind of second and third world problems, I guess. So that's I guess that's my response to that. Okay. So move, moving out of the weeds a little bit. Um this is something I actually feel really passionately about. Um who can get the monoclonal antibodies and why is it limited? I understand that when the EUA was written. Um, there was an expectation that there was going to be a huge run on this therapeutic, which was thought to be only available to the rich and famous and not available to anybody else. Um, but that has not ended up being the case at all. And we have paid for this treatment with our own tax dollars. How right now the therapeutics are sitting, sitting on shelves gathering dust. Um, how can we make sure that they get into arms as soon as possible? And is there anything in the works to broaden the EUA to cover people who would, are not currently also being protected by access to the vaccine? Because it seems like we're being redundant in the population who we're protecting and leaving everyone else out in the cold. Um, we quickly rejigger, we were nimble enough to rejigger the vaccine rules. Uh, they were also written under anticipation of scarcity, but we quickly moved the age limit from 75 to 65 to 55 as um, there was more availability. Is there an intent to open up this EUA so um, an average person who is 45 years old and with no pre existing conditions who is not eligible for the vaccine gets infected that they could um, avail themselves of this therapeutic? 
Yeah, I'll, I'll jump in on that. Um, so the the short answer is yes. Um, you know, when the initial uh, EUA came out, it was that was the perception. Uh, this is going to be there's going to be a shortage. There's going to be a, everyone's going to want this. Um, and the EUA was, I think, even more restrictive than a lot of people realize. Not only was it restricted to you know you have to meet certain criteria to get it, um, but you couldn't actually even as an urgent care, as an infusion center, as a primary care doctor, you couldn't even get access. The only access was if you were an acute care hospital that had participated in the remdesivir um, network. Um, and so that was one of the first things um, we did, United Health Group. I, I, by we, I mean uh, my, my buddy, Ben Wigand, who was on with the FDA. It seemed like every day for about a month, we were checking back and he was harassing them, um, basically saying, why? Why would you send an outpatient medicine to acute care hospitals? Um, they don't want to do this. They're drowning in acute COVID. Their ERs are full. Um, let us start doing it through um, outpatient infusions. Let us take this medicine and deliver it to people in their home. So that was a that was a victory, right? That took a month. It's yeah. odd to me that like restricting access was incorporated into an EUA. Um, the next thing, and I think a lot of us are starting to look at this and saying, you know what, if this was an FDA approved drug, um, with all that we're seeing with this incredible safety profile with decades of experience, why wouldn't I give it to someone who's a little bit younger? Um, I think this focus on um, hospitalization and death and not focusing on morbidity, not focusing on people who continue to suffer, not focusing on people who can't return to work because they, they have problems with word finding, uh, their hair falling out. I can't walk up a flight of stairs. Um, you know, here, Dr. Griffin. <laughs> so, so yes, there are efforts underway. Um, and actually that's, um, so I, people probably know about um, the different ways of accessing the product. And one of the ways is the United in Research option, where we are actually collecting data on people who receive this. And we are looking at, um, and we've talked to the FDA, looking at using that data to expand access, um, looking at more endpoints so that, yes, yeah, so let's let's say it's a, a woman in her 40s and she's taking care of kids. And, you know, I hate to say, but if she can't go up a flight of stairs and she can't word find and she can't be patient and do what she needs to do, that's a disaster. 100%. And <clears throat> and just from like a process standpoint, I, I, I think Dr. Griffin, you're probably, you're probably part of this. It, it's not necessarily an expansion of the EUA. The manufacturers would have to basically amend their EUA or the data from the EUA is so compelling that it then becomes what we call a BLA, kind of basically a full approval. And just, just to be clear, like once something is a full approval, um, there are many times where we do things that are not necessarily adherent exactly to the label. We kind of use drugs in many cases off label and that becomes another opportunity. I'm not encouraging off label utilization for this. I'm just saying that, you know, as we move with getting more data on the safety of this, I assume that the manufacturers and, and Dan, you may know are putting in kind of the BLA, the full application um, just like remdesivir and and then once that happens diana it will allow a more kind of liberal use in the sense that more people can be kind of an opportunity to access it because candidly a lot of the barriers especially when things are under an emergency authorization honestly have to do with payment and right now your tax dollars help to develop the drug but to pay for this, it's not a trivial consequence if an insurance company denies it because it was done outside of the boundaries of like the emergency use authorization guidelines. And there has been criticism of the you know, IDSA and others where there's been a perception that it's been, in, in my opinion, as an internist, overly negative about using these, the, using these therapies. So Dr. Patel, what would you tell your patient to, okay, I, I, I got my vaccine yesterday, but that came as a total shock when I showed up to Mount Sinai and they had extra doses and they decided that I was eligible for one under medical disposition from my doctor. But up until yesterday morning, I was going forward thinking that I would not be vaccinated until May. And were I to get reinfected tomorrow, I mean, I had COVID a year ago. Um, I you know, if I got reinfected tomorrow, I would be back in square one, back at square one with the same Tylenol, Gatorade, thoughts and prayers. Mm -hmm. um, 
how would it, 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 what would I do? Is there a way, are there trials that I could enter into? Are there compassionate use exceptions? Are there ways, what would you tell somebody who didn't fall under the clear structure of the EUA? Are there other ways to try to? There, there are definitely trials. So yes, I'm a big fan. And, and the answer is, if there is a question of, is there a trial underway for something related to COVID? The answer is yes. So yes. Go to um, com to sign up. <laughs> right, exactly. The, pro the problem is, are those trials, it, in my opinion, a lot of this becomes just more process that is put as a burden on a patient who is already overwhelmed and not as many systemic things in place to help that person kind of move through the system. So yes, there are trials in place, but they may not be exactly suited to kind of what you, Diana's needs might be. And then two, yes, you know, there is pretty strict there are compassionate kind of exceptions and no matter what the situation, there are situations in which we are able to use things. However, we call it compassionate use or an emergency access kind of not to be used regularly. And so here's where I would say that I'll just be honest, the criteria are actually, and Dan, tell me if I'm wrong, but the criteria are pretty broad. I mean, you know, diabetes, chronic kidney disease, BMI over 35, which sounds like a lot, and it is, but a lot of our of people in our country, immunosuppressive disease, you mentioned already the age over 55. A lot of people don't know, I'm not a pediatrician, but ages 12 to 17 qualify wow. if they have certain yeah. conditions. So I guess go to your website, go to the portal, because I actually yeah. believe there's yeah. more people that qualify for it than don't. What? GotCovid.org. There you go. Sorry, I should. <laughs> Whoever um, probably we should have put that on there. And then, and then, yes, ask. I think the biggest barrier, by the way, getting to your. We looked at the state of Maryland where I practice, and um, out of black, we had disproportionate black and brown communities affected by COVID, just like the rest of the country. Monoclonal antibody use, no shock to anybody, was less than a percent in those populations. It's, it's dismal everywhere, um, but it was less than a percent in populations of color. And then it was only about 4% in people. And these are of people who could meet the criteria based on How what I kind of rattled off. How can we do better there? Well, I think it I think it has to do, I'll just be honest. I, I, I don't think people like Dan Griffin need education on the utility of monoclonal antibody, but by the time they see Dan Griffin, they're either for, you know, far gone or, you know, you know, they just don't see people like Dr. Griffin on a regular basis. And what you said, Diana, is the most important. We're not getting tested in like routine kind of clinical settings. So the most important thing is if you reach out and you're getting your tests, not through a physician office, reach out to a physician who you trust. It might not be the, your primary care physician of record, by the way, but reach out to a physician who you trust. And if you don't feel like they're confident in their answer, I'm not going to be as confident at giving you like, here's what your IgG level should be on day five. But I'm going to be very confident in telling you, you are a good candidate for this treatment and I want to help you figure out how to get it. So if you don't get that receptivity or confidence in the answer, find another physician who does have some confidence or go to got COVID. What did, what did you just tell me to do? Got COVID.org. Got COVID.org. Sorry. So go or, or go to other peer, but don't waste time. And then if you're watching this, and I think the most stunning thing is how many people have adolescents who should be getting this really, truly, and have no clue because people do perceive it as like the Trump medicine. So it's for old people. Yeah. I think that's terrible and it's tragic. Yeah, and keep, I mean, we're going to get back to that in a minute because I actually have a specific question about use with, with kids. Um, but before we get there, are there any groups of people who should not be getting monoclonal antibodies? Specifically, um, I know we've been hearing about people with severe allergies with the vaccine, um, cancer patients who might have a compromised immune system. I know that if you have been on oxygen therapy, you are disqualified, but is there any other group that needs to be careful about this or is it does it really have a safe enough profile that it doesn't matter? Yeah, I'll jump in on that. Um, so the, um, the only contraindication we see here is if you miss your window. 
right? So when, you know, when someone is requiring oxygen, requiring being admitted to the hospital, it's not that we withhold the life-saving therapy. It's that we feel like, ooh, that window has closed. You got into that early inflammatory phase. We didn't jump in early enough to abort it. Um, and that was actually, you know, those, those trials that we discussed, Steve Catani and I discussed back in April that we wondered why they were doing. Well, okay, the, the data out of there was actually maybe you do harm if you give it after that window closes. Um, but these are incredibly safe, and, I, and I've gotten to be um, um, involved with the, the calls um, from Regeneron, from Eli Lilly to the FDA, and thousands of people have gotten these therapies. I have to say it's approaching 10,000 just right here in the New York tri-state area, and the safety profile continues to be incredibly safe. Is there anything that you need to do to prepare to get it, um, you know, and can you drive yourself? Um, is it, you know, what is the actual process like? Yeah, I should, I'll describe um, the process here in New York area. And then Dr. Patel, maybe can give us the experience down there. Um, but here in New York, we have three main uh, ways that people are accessing therapy. Um, two of them can involve driving yourself or, or someone else driving you. Um, and this is, again, as we try to reinforce, this is the first week, you're still feeling okay, but we risk stratify and we say, you know what, you've got a more than 10% chance of ending up in the hospital. You're at increased risk. Let's not let this window close without stepping in and clearing the virus before it potentially makes you sick. So that person might still feel okay. They might get in the car. They might have signed up for one of the Northwell portals. There's a dozen different of these tents where they end up going. They're directed to go there um, after their physician has filled out a form online. Um, they don't go into the hospital. They don't go into the air. They go to this outside tent. I think they're heated. They are heated. That was a joke. Um, and they get their infusion there. Um, and it's a few hours, um, as long as you can find parking. Um, the Catholic um, health system has been great. Um, a couple of their hospitals, you just show up and they actually have a CDU, clinical decision unit, um, where actually they have it set up where people come, they come right in, they get the infusion right there so they can be sent directly to um, the physician and just say, you head over there. Um, and then we have the United in Research where the patient themselves can pick up the, the phone. They can call. You don't need a doctor standing between you and treatment. Um, and within, as mentioned, 24 to 36 hours, that treatment is done in the home. The infusion nurses come out. Um, they explain. They, they give you the infusion. Um, and then they observe, make sure you're doing okay. So in the New York area, I have to say we're kind of privileged except for the inequity. People don't know about this. Um, and particularly the communities that have been hardest hit. They don't realize that for free, all these three options are available. We have a pretty, in Maryland, in the DMV, kind of DC, Maryland, Virginia area, we have a little bit more of a kind of a system in place that's, it, it can be somewhat prohibitive if you have a physician who doesn't want to do it, but we have about um, 10 kind of large, whether they're hospital or actually regional infusion centers. We actually also have um, in Baltimore, a Baltimore Convention Center field hospital set up to do this as well. So we have multiple sites that try to get kind of in all the, you know, we, we like to say that you don't have to be anywhere near more than an hour from a, kind of a, a where, where you can get monoclonal antibodies. We do, it, it, the states and district do require that we document some level of symptoms. And this becomes a bit of a trip for people because um, some doctors unfortunately are still just like asking about some of the very traditional symptoms of COVID. And I'll be honest, I have yet to find a patient who when you really spend time and talk to them does not have something like fat fatigue, malaise, or a sense of, you know, I think now, Diana, some have called it like the brain fog, but people unfortunately are feeling the need to have kind of classic symptoms. And sometimes that has prohibited people having access to it. But uh, we as like clinic-based providers will kind of complete this, we'll fax it to the different jurisdictions. And then we, they try to make it easy once we send something because the states kind of get a lot of this supply and then distribute it to those hospitals and regional infusion centers. Their job is to then kind of com immediately contact the patient and set up whatever mechanism is convenient for the patient with the goal of getting them to the site closest physically to the patient. And then it's actually handed off from me, my office to this kind of centralized referral center that does all the coordination 
Um, we've even fought in our region to have uh, transportation services provided and paid for, and that's been agreed to. So it's been great, but I hate to say it, it's taken us months of doing it wrong to kind of start to get it right. And it just makes me sad because we could have done this for a lot more people. Well, we can always change things and do it better going forward. And one of those things is to plan ahead. Um, so if you go to gotcovid.org, one of the options is um, to sign yourself up and your friends, your parents, um, they can have a home kit um, where they have, they can easily get a, an at-home test so they have it ready so they don't have to waste the time in getting um, the PCR results and you can have a plan in place. Um, okay, we cannot get through this without talking about long-term COVID because this is Survivor Corps after all. So I have a number of questions about these. So this has been a really interesting week as Survivor Corps as we are learning in our own polling that over one third of our patients who've received both doses of the vaccine seem to be improving. Um, and situations that have been really been intractable thus far. Mm -hmm. um, really nothing has been helping these folks and, and not everybody is being helped. And there is definitely vascular and inflammatory damage you know, that this is not going to touch. Um, and we, we can't say this, any of this definitively, this is anecdotal. At this point, we are launching a study with Yale that will hopefully start in the next couple of weeks um, so that we can actually be tracking this and really figuring it out. But when I was asking at the beginning about it being an antiviral, mm -hmm. if, if this is leading us to a suspicion that there could be viral persistence, what are the options, do you think, from a scientific point of view of using monoclonal antibodies as an alternative to in, in terms of helping people with long-term COVID recover if it is in fact, if there is viral persistence and it is working as an antiviral? And just to tack on to that, could we take advantage of the fact that monoclonals are approved for everyone down to the age of 12 and we have a lot of children who are really, really suffering from long-term COVID and there will not be a vaccine available to them for many, many months. I know that was a lot to pack into one question. So I'm gonna let you each give your own response. Sure. Uh, Dr. Patel, do you wanna go first? I'll go second. No, go ahead. Okay, thank you. Brains um, all right. <laughs> Uh, so, so a couple, a couple responses. So one is um, that yes, this is I find this incredibly exciting for so many of my. Um, you were, the, you were the, one of the first people to bring this up. <laughs> yes. Well, I was, I was, I went into the, the vaccination uh, process with my patients with a bit of trepidation. Um, I was a little worried, like, um, are you, is this going to be a setback? You know, and I let them all know, hey, we're going to schedule an appointment two weeks after the first shot because I want to hear how it goes. Um, yeah. And tracking everything, looking for every side effect, everything that could possibly go wrong. It never occurred to us that things would go right. <laughs> I, I was really pleasantly surprised. This, I don't think what anyone was expecting. Um, and yeah, that's what I'm seeing. Uh, somewhere 30, 40% of the patients that I take care of personally, that we take care of at ProHealth New York are saying, hey, about two weeks after that first shot, I started to feel better. And now we're post second shot and we have a big chunk of people feeling better. So this is exciting. Um, and I think it actually makes us 38% see so I'm right on 30 to 40% this is great <laughs> so um, let's, let's push it past 40 if we can we're all getting the same number so far yeah so this yeah no but we, we we tried to do this poll a few weeks ago and we were not getting the same results and I wonder if it was only the second dose that did the trick for people because we were not seeing this um after people's first dose Oh, interesting. Huh. Uh, yeah. So this, so I have to say for me, I'm, I'm hearing enough feedback that I, I believe this is real. I believe the vaccine is doing something. Um, yeah. And I think what that does is it, um, it challenges um, us to understand better maybe the mechanism of what's going on with long COVID. And, and there's a couple of theories here. Um, one of them is the viral persistence theory. 
Um, and there was a great paper um, out of uh, out of uh, Rockefeller, Michelle Newson Swag, brilliant man. Um, it didn't make it through to the final print, but in the preprint, he has these pictures of what look like viral particles in the small intestine. You know, and th this is a bat virus, and bats bats get diarrhea from this. So you know, th this is not you know, it's not definitive, but one of the theories was that people fail to clear the virus, and there's a low level of virus in the system that just keeps poking the immune system, we keep feeling sick because we've never fully recovered. Do you know that there are pockets of, um, that there are viral pockets that remain, uh, or viral reservoirs that remain in periodontal pockets, in the gut, in the brain that has been found, in the mastoid, in various areas of the body that they have found viral reservoirs? So I would say that this feeds into that idea that maybe maybe viral persistence and um, people get in the weeds about latency versus persistence versus, you know, whatever you want to call it, but the idea that there's still virus there uh, and maybe the vaccine allows people to finally clear that. Um, so th then that actually brings us back to the monoclonals and says, you know what, if the vaccine is generating this robust immune response that clears it, you know, maybe that's T cells, but if it's those neutralizing antibodies, then maybe it's worth doing a trial in long COVID individuals and seeing if we see the same response. Uh, so I have to say this, this to me um, is really a bit of a push to say, let's consider that. I mean, we know it's not a great thing to do in the, in this, we'll say third week of acute COVID, but what about people that made it through and have this long COVID. I, I think it's worth studying. So yeah, I think that that's what a about fascinating. Day 250 of having a fever and, you know what I mean? Where yeah. there's something, Dr. Patel, what do you think? About, I, I couldn't hear you. Something about a fever, what were you okay, saying? No, no, no. I was just seeing in general, in terms of its application for long-term COVID. Oh yeah. Um, what do you think the, what are your theories on in terms of the vaccine helping? And if the vaccine is helping, wouldn't it make sense that the monoclonals would do the same in terms of acting as an antiviral? And then also with the um, flexibility of being able to give it to uh, kids as young as 12 who are fall under the EUA before there's a vaccine available. No, I mean, this is why I referenced kind of like a history of monoclonal antibodies being used in other disease areas. So I, I do think there is going to be, it's unfortunate that we've just never like really kind of put as much of an investment until recently into kind of the long COVID and what the research needs to look like. But I, I completely agree with Dr. Griffin that we're going to likely see some incredible trials as well as hopefully results to match on like utilizing a number of these therapies for long COVID. And I hate to say it, but Diana, you're pointing out, like we're talking about long COVID kind of almost like it's, I, I know the three of us don't assume this, but if we then think about like with other viruses, kind of a post-inflammatory syndrome, or to, I think you're alluding to this, like a resurgence or higher level of activity or a reinfection, or a second infection. And I know all these things can mean somewhat different things, but essentially the same thing where your body is getting assaulted in different points in time. Then I think it almost kind of begs the question like, all right, do we reset the clock and start all of these things again? And then, and I, and I think the answer will be yes, but not necessarily as clunky as we're doing now. Like right now we're really using this bifurcation of like how sick you are and kind of where the site of kind of, you know, are you in the hospital with supplemental oxygen? If so, then you're not the right candidate. And I think with trial data and understanding more and more, we will have a better, uh, just like we do with osteoporosis, just like we do with cancer, just like we do with other therapies, we'll understand better when to use them. And like we talk about with cancer and recurrences, I think we're going to have that same issue with long COVID as well. Do you know if there are any studies that people could sign up for now? I think that most people who are suffering from long-term COVID would do just about anything mm -hmm. to try to find something that would relieve their symptoms because right now they are literally going bankrupt, going from specialist to specialist, getting yep an image after image that's showing up with either permanent damage, which I don't know whether there's anything we can do about, or unexplained issues that maybe this is the answer to. I know there's, I'm, since I'm down the street from the NIAID and the NIH, I know there are trials going on at the NIH to try to even just get people who are 
not just the registry that I think Diana you worked on and probably you did too, Dr. Griffin, but I know that there are trials with various kinds of therapies that they're trying here. So I think the answer is yes. The question will be, will it be something off that will be convenient for anybody to participate in? And I think we need to keep pushing the research. A lot of it has to do with research dollars. So I think the more dollars that become available, you will see more opportunities. Well, hopefully now that the NIH has unleashed all of this money for task research, um, <laughs> some of it will get directed towards there. Um, I, we have gone over time and I haven't even hit my last page of questions, but we're unfortunately gonna have to wrap it up there. There's so much information and both of you were so incredibly informative. Thank you both so much for coming on. Um, and I hope that you will come back again. Um, this was a tremendous honor and treat to have you both with us today. Um, thank you on behalf of Survivor Corps to all of you out there. Please pay attention to the polls that we are pinning to the top of the group every day. These are the polls that get sent to the scientists and get studies started. So it is vital that you that you fill them out. They only take a minute and it is the difference between these studies happening and not. So you are you are what the you are the linchpin of this scientific process. You as the patient, by adding in your voice and contributing, you are the catalyst for these scientific studies for Dr. Patel and Dr. Griffin to go figure out how to take your experiences and translate that into saving lives. So thank you all to all you superheroes out there and immediately go to gotcovid.org, tell everyone you know, and go into the Giphy search engine and look up monoclonal antibodies. We made you some really, really good ones. They're, they're really cool. So enjoy, spread them around on social media and tag me. We will see you all soon. Thank you very much for joining us. Mm -hmm.